One of the more disturbing great works of film art, I think, ever made. It's Mikhail Haneke, the great Austrian director's early film, Funny Games. Let me tell you why I think this controversial film, supposedly controversial, is great, and why I really appreciate it. Coming up next. Funny Games is right in the center of postmodernism, the heart of postmodernism. In fact, if I were to give students an example of a postmodern film, this might actually be the one I would give to them. What do I mean by that? There are a thousand definitions of postmodernism, but one of them is that the film itself or the text itself is showing that it's constructed and thus even talking to viewers about how it's constructed. That's what's going on in here, at least a couple of times. Now, it doesn't happen throughout the film as in something like Stranger Than Fiction, only in a few moments and they're, they're very jarring because of that a couple of fourth wall breaks and, and there's another thing that goes on near the end of the movie that I cannot spoil if you've never seen it in fact you should just go watch this movie before I start to talk about the plot or anything else I watched this movie without knowing what was going to happen I knew had no knowledge going into it what it was about or what was going to happen I think that's the best way to experience this film don't even read a plot summary of it just say Okay, it's Criterion Collection. Matthew says to watch it. Just go watch it. That is sufficient, especially if you like Hitchcock or Kubrick, something like that. This is your film. But back to postmodernism, you know, spoiler alerts now. At the end of the movie or near the end, a character, one of them, rewinds the film itself to have another <laughs> narrative. Or the narrative branches off, as it were, and then there's a backtracking, and then it goes into another narrative. This kind of thing is postmodernism 101. Now, it had been happening in literary art for some time, but definitely in the 1990s, the questioning of what a text is, how it's related to reality, showing that a text is completely fictional and not maybe even serious, and that there's an author behind the scenes constructing and everything and pulling the strings. That's one of the things going on in this movie. What do you mean? Do you think they have a chance to win? They are on their side, right? So, on their side. However, there's another side of the postmodernism of this movie. By showing that it's constructed, it's also asking viewers how they watch movies like this, thriller movies, let's say, or horror movies. As Haneke has said many times during interviews, you know, this is really about how audiences really love to see people killed, killed off in movies, let's say. This is something that Hitchcock, in at least the 1940s and 50s, if beyond, was well aware of and dealing with what people want and desire. Hitchcock had a, I think, a low view of human nature, and as a Catholic interested in original sin, he believed, I think, or at least acted on that belief in his films, that there, everyone has a monster inside of them, that they want terrible things to happen. They want b murder. They desire murder. Not all the time, not of everybody, but in certain times and places, and that's partly why we watch entertainment that has violence in it, to see people killed off in that cathartic experience that Aristotle talks about, that relief, emotional relief from seeing people die, tragedies happen. Why would we want that? Right? Maybe it's because we do separate fiction from reality and we know when we're watching a play or a movie it is fictional, thus we can differentiate between what's an unreal and what's real. Nevertheless, it's hard when you suspend your disbelief not to see a character on the screen as a real person getting killed off in a horror movie. And so you see predators and prey in this movie. The two young men go after the bourgeois family at their lakeside house. They're actually going after several families near the lakeside house and you get I think the homage to Kubrick and Clockwork Orange, really this movie, to me as I watch it, is if you saw from the victim's perspective, what does it be like to attack by Alex and the Droogs, the young men, semi-celebrated but messed with in Clockwork Orange, both the book and the movie. You're in a hostage-taking situation, you're in a, a torture environment, and it is it's really awful. It's real, still shocking to me to watch this movie, even though film has shown all the things that you see in this movie before. The way this movie shoots its, you know, horrific scenes is really excruciating. Part of that is the predator-prey dynamic, the two men playing around cruelly with the family that they're torturing. They are, on the one hand, polite. They are, you know, they, they're morally condescending. But on the other hand, they're ultra-violent and they have no motives. That's one of the disturbing things about them. We don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Are they total nihilists or something else? We don't know. One angle to this movie is that the young men may not be men. I mean, they remind me, reading enough classical texts as I have, that they could be gods. 
They could be some kind of spirit, some kind of alien, some kind of demon. Who knows? You don't have to take them as human beings. But clearly the postmodernism of the film shows you that these men are aware that the film is being filmed. And are they stand-ins for the scriptwriter, for the director, for the creators of this movie? Maybe. Maybe they're the authors of this text and they want to show you what they're doing. Maybe that's what they're doing is performing for an audience that they know about behind the camera, which is us. In a couple moments, one of the men seems to be the, the alpha of the scenario, winks at the camera and looks at it and breaks the fourth wall. The question is, why does Haneke have this character do this? I think it's Hitchcockian. There's a moral component to it asking us, why do we want to see what we're about to see? Why are we watching what we are watching? In a sense, it's a postmodernist way of critiquing postmodernism. This text is constructed. It's showing us that it's fake. It's fictional. And the two young men have a conversation about reality and fiction very late in the movie on a boat. When Kelvin die Gravitation überwindet, dann stellt sich heraus, dass es ein Universum wirklich, das andere aber nur Fiktion ist. Wie stellt sich das raus? Das weiß ich, es war so eine Art Modellprojektion im Cyberspace. Und wo ist er jetzt dann hell? In der Wirklichkeit oder in der Fiktion? Seine Familie ist in der Wirklichkeit und in einer Fiktion. On the other hand, even if it is constructed, it is a simulation of reality. And as such, it is related to reality and the moral component or aspect of our reality. Thus, I think that's partly why we're disturbed. I think most people would be. I certainly am by this movie. What these two young men are about, you know, is a predecessor to the Joker depicted in several movies. From, you know, the Nolan Batman movies, who's a nihilist and other Batman fare to the Anton Chigurh character, both in the Cormac McCarthy novel, No Country for Old Men, and in the movie, played by Javier Bardem. These amoral figures are just playing around, and thus the title, Funny Games. These men are playing games with their victims, a la the literary games played by this movie with viewers. The question of why people are cruel to other people and what do they get out of it is a really interesting one. I think it's at the heart, or it's one of the main aspects of this movie, that ask viewers themselves, why are you, I, I feel like this whole movie turns to me, why are you cruel to other people? Why have you been cruel, especially in youth, as youth culture and these two young men are featured in this movie. When you were younger as a kid or as a teenager, as a young man, why were you cruel to other people? What did you want? when you were doing that. And thus I think this movie is descriptive, not prescriptive. It's not telling us to do what these men are doing. It's asking us questions about why these kinds of things happen in the real world, even though it's showing us that it's a fictional construct as well. There's so many remarkable moments in this movie from, uh, there's a shot that's three, maybe five minutes long, and it's really poignant on Haneke's part. But the one I really love, or the, the few shots I love, the scene where the woman escapes the house, is going out to looking for help, and stares down the road and there are two headlights coming at her and then she avoids the first car tries to run after it and the second car the headlights comes down the road and she's looking at it and each of those is a moral choice it's a gamble it's a risk those are just very very well done on Haneke's part those wonderful long shots and that is definitely the Hitchcockian element of this movie. I do recommend you read Jim Emerson's review of the remake of this movie, Haneke, in a definitely postmodernist move, remade this movie shot for shot in an English version in 2007. This video, of course, refers to the 1997 version of the movie, but Emerson reviews the movie basically and gives it half a star. I really respect Emerson, so I think his critique is worth watching, especially notice he's writing from a time in the mid-2000s where he's worried about torture and horrific scenes of war, a lot of the post 9-11 and Iraq war material uh, right around 2007 or so. Nevertheless, I think he's short-sighted on this one because this is asking us why people torture, why we like to be entertained by torture. Um, and why we why we might root on people who are torturing other people. You will see, just go to Twitter, videos of people beating up other people and a crowd of onlookers cheering on the person beating up the other person on the street seemingly for no reason. This has been happening basically forever in human history. So the question is, why are we cruel to other people? I think that makes this film entirely moral, or one could at least watch it that way. And last, what's the responsibility of the creator, the director, the artist, the author, in making entertainment that has violence in it? Haneke is asking that question, I think. This film is asking that question. What are you trying to do when you're making films 
that contain things that may stir up your audience may make them desire what they see on screen or stir up their desires for murder, for theft, and other obviously immoral actions. So for all those reasons, I find this movie great, but it is disturbing, and I wouldn't recommend it to most people that I know because it requires great attention and it requires great thought and probably conversation afterwards. I wouldn't just go watch this movie just for the sake of watching a movie. It doesn't really work that way. What do you think of funny games? What do you think of what I said in this video? And have you watched the remake? And is it as good or not good? Let us know in the comments. And what other Hanukkah movies should we watch if we like funny games? Let us know. You guys are great at doing that on this channel. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more content. Have a great day.